Um, my name is Carolyn, and um, I'm the clinical coordinator of physical therapy um, in the rehab department. And my name again is Melina Dumpe. I'm an occupational therapist and also the occupational therapy clinical coordinator. So um, some of the things that we hope that you'll take home um, from this presentation is um, that you'll be able to describe spasticity and how it affects function and quality of life, understand the role of OTPT in speech, um, also um, using possible or understand the po um, different rehab treatment options used to help manage um, spasticity and to optimize function and then also understand um, how important it is to continue to participate in um, daily activities to help promote function and um, stimulate increased quality of life. So what is spasticity? Um, there's many different ways to describe spasticity. Um, but the main way to, de um, to describe it is that it's velocity dependent and it definitely affects um, your function and it can affect any muscle in your body. So how does it impact you as an individual with spasticity or a family member with um, somebody who has spasticity? And um, you, spasticity it requires more energy and um, also to expand everyday activities. Um, definitely you have decreased endurance and greater fatigue over time just because the muscle is continually um, active. Um, and you might need to manage um, the pain um, due to the spasm, skin breakdown um, due to poor positions or limited movement, which can lead to pressure ulcers, and then um, orthopedic um, deformities, such as um, contractions or dislocations. Um, there's also greater time requirements that's required to do um, different activities, such as walking, eating, um, dressing and bathing. Um, you might see psychosocial act, um, difficulties um, arise because um, there might be depression due to um, decreased social interaction. Um, also, depending on the severity of the contractures and the increased tone, um, the assistant um, level might be needed to um, complete daily activities, so there might be an increased um, level, level of care for um, the caregiver. And then um, definitely making sure there's an active um, participation in spasticity management with um, a team approach. So um, for OTPT and speech, um, we have different roles um, for the occupational therapist. They address fine motor, visual motor skills, um, activities of daily living, feeding and swallowing dysfunction, um, sensory processing, range of motion, um, strength and muscle control um, to basically help increase independence or engagement with the environment. Um, physical therapy, we um, address gross motor skills, strength, balance, uh, motor coordination, range of motion, um, posture, endurance, gait, pain management, and then also movement and function also. And speech and language also addresses um, cognition, communication skills, um, auditory processing, oral, mo oral motor, um, feeding and swallowing dysfunction. Um, and then all of the dif disciplines will evaluate um, the functional um, level and needs of the individual to determine whether or not um, therapy is indicated. And then also we'll create um, a treatment plan and then also goal setting goals with um, the family because it's really important to get the family and the individual involved. And then also collaborating with um, other team members involved in the care. So the team members, it could include um, the physician, nurse, um, um, definitely the family and the individual, um, social worker, case manager, whoever's involved in that. And then also just educating the family and the individual um, in their care. So um, managing spasticity through therapy, there's definitely uh, many different types um, of treatment plans and each of them vary with the individual and um, the, the, um, the the severity of the spasticity. Um, so some of the different treatment plans include splinting, orthotic, serial casting, stretching, strengthening, positioning, modalities, and um, different therapeutic techniques. 
So for splinting and orthotics, um, the main purpose is to facilitate um, an appropriate alignment and positioning, help to decrease contractures, um, help to enhance function, uh, maintain and increase um, range of motion or improve joint stability and pre prevent deformity, and then also um, help with the energy expenditure during gait. And then at home, um, the individual should um, make sure that they're still functional within their environment when they're using like a splint or an orthotics. And if they're not, then they should um, definitely talk to their um, their therapist to, um, to discuss that. And then um, making sure to follow through with the wear schedules um, to help um, with the results. Here are just some examples. So this is an example of an orthotic, it's just a solid AFO. And then here is a hand splint. So um, if you guys want later, you can come up and look at it. And so you just put the hand in a more open position if um, they're really contracted. And then um, this is serial casting. So um, this is a serial cast of the knee. And it could, serial casting can occur in different joints of the, um, the body. And so this one is one of the knee. So for serial casting, you um, want to gain range of motion through progressive casting of the joint. So um, you'll do um, casting, kind of depends. Um, it could be one to two times per week, depending on, um, on the, on, the individual, and then um, and that's to help um, gain the range, and then for home, just making sure that the um, cast is dry, making sure that you monitor changes in skin color, um, and then signs of pain, and then making sure to still stay active um, even if you are still casted, and then um, after removal of the cast, um, um, start a home program. And then um, also we want to do stretching, strengthening. For the stretching, stretching we want to maintain and increase the range of motion, increase the functional mobility, and help to decrease contractures. And then for strengthening, we like to um, increase the range of motion, or active range of motion, and then help increase the functional mobility and increase the motor control of the muscle. Um, for home, for stretching, just uh, making sure that it's a slow, prolonged stretching of the muscles. And you can also help put um, like a warm compress or a heat pack over the muscle belly to help relax the muscle before um, stretching. And then with the strengthening, um, just incorporating, incorporating daily activities um, at home, so it's like dressing, helping to carry groceries, pushing and pulling different objects, or um, even something like riding a bike is also helping um, with that. Okay. Another way to manage spasticity is through um, positioning. So this is just, we're going to look at some different things about positioning, but one thing is taping and strapping. Um, we actually brought one of our dolls here to kind of show you a little bit. Um, one of them, first of all, is called Theratogs. I'll use this other one. Um, it's just a garment with straps. What it does is, because of the strapping and, and the alignment of the straps, depending on which way you pull it, you're actually going to pull the muscles and, and the position of the child, whether it's their legs or shoulders, so forth, in a position that you want. So you're going to kind of create better alignment, and in that, they're going to be able to strengthen muscles that maybe they haven't been able to use previously because they've been used compensating with other muscles. So it's a great way. Um, it typically, Theratox kind of works better with children with milder forms of spasticity. If the tone is just too high, then it's too much of a pull. Um, against the, the line of pull that we're using with strapping. That is one option. Um, the other one is Luco tape. It's a rigid tape that helps with alignment. So um, yeah, this is just an example of the tape. But you put um, a hypofix underneath it, and then you put the Luco tape on top, and it just helps position the actual body in, in a certain position that you want for better alignment. Um, kinesio tape is a really flexible tape that helps um, kind of either support or inhibit muscles. So for example, here we went ahead and we put it just right over the feet for more of a, a dorsiflexion. Um, and also, we happen to have it on myself. <laughs> um, for most of the kids, they usually tolerate this fairly well. Some kids are more sensitive on their skin. Um, we do end up noticing some redness, so there's other techniques that you can use um, to help or facilitate, or not to get the skin irritation. But basically here, like, depending on the line of pull that you have, this is going to facilitate me supinating my hand or basically turning it over like that. So which helps me grab onto something versus grabbing onto something like this. And basically a carryover to home, which is something that's really nice about the different tapes and strapping, is that a lot of parents are just able to learn what the technique is, and then they're able to actually put it on their child. So of course, tape and, and 
tape only lasts maybe three to five days, depending how much you rub it, how much the towel gets dirty, so forth. Um, so it's definitely something that parents can kind of do on their own, uh, once taught by the therapist, of course. Managing specificity through positioning, adaptive equipment. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the different types of standards that there are, and adaptive seating. So we're talking about the wheelchairs, feeding chairs, stroller chairs. Um, again, what we're looking for is what is the alignment of the child when they're sitting in this or when they're actually using this adaptive equipment. So we're hoping for the best alignment possible. If they're sitting in a, in a certain chair, is their head and neck you know, hyperextended or are they kind of flexed forward and their, their visual regard can be for something that they're looking in right in front of them. Um, this is going to help with them being able to reach better, being able to maybe maintain focus on an object um, and so forth. So um, again, the carryover to home is to actually be able to use a lot of these different equipment um, so the child doesn't necessarily just stay in the stander all day or stay in the stroller all day. Um, there are different modalities as well that can be used, a lot of the therapists use. Um, one is cryotherapy. It decreases resistance to muscle in the rapid stretch. Basically what it is, it's cold temperature. So you might um, quickly place a child's hand who's fisted into a cold temperature, like ice water or something like that, and then pull it out. And you might have to do that for about three different times. And you, what you'll see is that release of the muscle, and then you can from there, maybe do active range of motion or passive range of motion and get a, a better stretch. Same thing happens with heat. Um, you can use heat packs to facilitate that um, muscle relaxation. Um, vibration also works as well. Um, a lot of times we use like mini massagers or um, an infant massager, and we put that over, typically over the muscle belly. Now, it just depends on which muscle belly you want to use, which muscle you're trying to activate a little bit more. So um, if the child's in, in an elbow flexion like this, um, we can place it, the vibration right over the biceps, right over the, the belly of the biceps, and it actually, over time, it will help decrease um, it'll basically overstimulate the muscle so that the muscle actually decreases in, in its contraction. Um, if we're trying to strengthen the opposite muscle, then we're going to go ahead and place it over here so we can activate that muscle a little bit more in, in hopes that we end up getting more extension at the elbow. Um, the other one is electrical stimulation. Again, it's kind of the, the same idea as the vibration, except it can be for a longer period of time that we end up using it. Um, Carry over to home is basically some of the families can use the cryotherapy or cold temperatures, warm temperatures, vibration just with the mini massagers that we we're talking about to be able to use that right before maybe doing a range of motion exercises and so forth. Um, the other one is just through therapeutic techniques. Um, a lot of therapists are trained in myofascial release, which is basically the hands-on technique that provides sustained pressure into myofascial restrictions to eliminate pain and restore motion. Um, it basically allows um, the deep tissue kind of a relaxation to the deep tissue, which again allows for more range. Um, we also have neuro de neurodevelopmental treatment, or NDT. Um, it was an approach that was developed for the treatment of individuals with pathophysiology of the central nervous system. Um, what's really great about the NDT is a, it's a really hands-on approach. So basically the therapist is able to not only put their hands on the child but also teach the family how to do the same thing to help, um, help stimulate certain muscles, help align the body, help strengthen certain muscles. And so um, one of the things that we really like to do, because one of the, the main points of control that a lot of um, NDT, I guess instructors point out, is that um, it's a, it kind of really begins in the hips. If your hips are aligned properly, then kind of the rest of your body kind of goes in that direction and so forth. So um, one of the examples would be if everyone doesn't mind sitting towards the edge of their chair. Um, I know if you want to grab a chair too, but we can sit towards the edge of the chair just a little bit. What we'd like you to do is basically slouch. So you're going to just kind of sit back like that, slouch forward, bring your head down and look towards the ground. And if you're really, if, you're, if your back is kind of just really slouched over, um, you're going to really feel that what's happening in your body is kind of collapsing upon itself, essentially. Um, so now if you try to reach, I know the table's in front of you, stay in that position, but just try to bring your hand forward as high as you can, reach up for that ceiling, and see how difficult it is. If you stay in that position, don't, go, don't straighten your body up. <laughs> that would be cheating right now. Um, so you're going to see how difficult that is to actually do that. Now, if a child doesn't have the right support within their whole trunk and in their hips, then it's going to be really hard for them to be able to reach or say, a toy that's all the way up high. So now if you go ahead, keep your arm up as high as you had it, 
Now go ahead and straight, straighten your body out so you're going to sit up nice and tall, and you're going to see how much higher you can reach. So it's just kind of those little differences. Luckily for us, we have more control in our body, so we're able to do it on our own. But for somebody else who needs um, just like the therapeutic handling of, of having a therapist or a parent learn those techniques and actually be able to facilitate them doing that, then it can make a huge difference. So you know, a child can actually reach for that toy that they've been wanting to get. Um, the other thing is uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, it's PNF, it's what we call it, is just different patterns that you can use. Um, Carolyn can actually show you <laughs> one of them. They're basically just different patterns that we use to reach for objects to do exercises. Um, so she can reach up and go down. And what's nice is that you're, you're basically strengthening or contracting and lengthening certain muscles. So you're never staying in a constant motion like this. I'm just grabbing for one direction. No, I'm moving the arm through the whole entire range and movement. So I'm strengthening and I'm lengthening certain muscles and then I'm doing the opposite of it. So I, it strengthens basically both sides or your agonist and your antagonist muscle. So again, the carry over here to home is you know, we greatly encourage families to work with a therapist to come into the sessions, observe everything, because the idea is the therapist is there with the, the child for a brief period of time, that hour a week or two hours a week, but the carryover is really going to happen at the home life. So how do we make it easiest for the family to be able to incorporate this at home? If something doesn't work with the schedule, then again, we ask for the parents to let us know, then how can we do it so, you know, that the family is able to carry, carry over these skills? Did I skip one? Probably not. Um, okay, just want to make sure I didn't skip one. So one of the other uh, activities here is just how do we do this into our daily activities? So we talked about um, hygiene and grooming. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry, I think I, I skipped one somehow. There we go. <laughs> We're going to go back to body position. Somehow I must have double pushed the button. Um, Another way is through positioning of the bodies, like we just talked about a little bit. Um, one of the great reasons why this is so important is because, again, it supports proper alignment, decrease in joint deformity, um, in the pressure sores, um, enhancing function, stimulating arousal level, reducing synergy patterns. Um, so what we're looking for is like carryover to home would be, for example, if you have a, an infant, you know, how is it that you can carry your child? One thing is a lot of times you have the child who has um, more of the legs adducted or you get kind of that scissoring of the legs just because this, the muscles are so tight. So one of the examples would be just holding the child with their legs abducted. Now typically you would think, well, most children are held this way. Well, that's great. <laughs> but the thing is, it's just thinking through it like this is actually helping my child. It's not just that I'm just holding my child this way. This is actually helping my child stretch out those muscles. Again, the other thing is um, a lower extremity dissociation is what we call it. So um, being able to hold your child like this where you have um, flexion of kind of one side or contracting the muscles on one side of the body and you're kind of extending on the other side of the body. So you can do it. And then switching sides again. Mm -hmm. And then um, another position would be prone. So being lying down on your tummy. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can actually hold the child like this as you're walking around with the child. The great thing is what is the child doing? The child's lifting their head up against gravity and they're working on strengthening those muscles as well. Um, and depending on you know, the child itself, you can have their legs bent, you can have them reaching up, I mean, you can give them a lot of vestibular movement, meaning moving them through space, which is really great for arousal level as well. Um, the other one that we have here is curled up, <laughs> which is just basically kind of preventing the hyperextension that some kids may do with their back and their arms that kind of go out like this and their legs get extended. So if you have their hips flexed, then it's going to be much more difficult for them to, be, to go into that hyperextension. So here we have hips flexed, knees flexed, arms forward to midline, which is really great because then you bring the hands um, and eyes typically together again to be able to play or focus on their hands or focus on you on what's in front of them. Um, if they're lying down too, you can, maybe we can use this right here, um, we can have them lying down and use towel rolls as well, kind of behind the shoulders, behind both sides of the shoulders. And again, that, what that does is it brings the arms forward. So you're getting kind of a nice stretch back here, but more than anything, it's a way to kind of be able to play. It's, it's making more of the body awareness here. Um, the other place would be right underneath the knees, um, again, to flex the, the hips. Probably need a bigger one for this doll, but to flex the hips. Um, and that just puts the child again in a better position so they're not going into the hyperextension. 
Uh, one of the great things that you know we try to promote, if we're sitting down, is getting those hips in 90s, the knees in 90s, and the ankles in, in 90 degrees. Um, again, you tried sitting in a different position. You can see it's much harder for your alignment. It's much harder to focus. Um, the other really important part is being able to be stable. If you're sitting and the child is trying to work on some fine motor or, or even writing or something like that, that really takes more concentration, then how do we expect them to be able to do that if they're trying to just focus on sitting up? So if we're really doing something that's challenging, like a fine motor skill, then we really need to make sure that their body is well supported as well. Um, standing is also a great activity. It can be done at home, can be done during therapy. It's a great way of doing weight bearing, which works on strengthening. Um, we put down just some keys to help out with positioning, which is again increasing that hip flexion um, just to decrease the hyperextension and providing support to the to, in neck flexion for the neutral. We want to make sure that we keep that head roughly looking you know, straight ahead as opposed to too far down where we're just looking at the floor or too high up where we're just looking at the ceiling. I'm going to forward through a few slides now. So again, ways to promote optimal stimulation and our function within the daily activities is just going back and taking a look at what are our daily activities that we're doing you know, every day. What, it, what exactly is it? We typically have to do the hygiene, grooming activities, dressing. So how do we make that functional in the sense of how do we make sure that that child is getting the stretching that they need, the strengthening that they need, maybe some of that movement. A lot of times children who have um, hyper um, or have spasticity have a tendency not to move as much, right? So they typically stay in one position. So you can think of a child who maybe loves to swing because that's just a movement that they haven't really been going, able to do previously. So uh, maybe while they're dressing, you know, we can have them in a supine position uh, lying on their back and maybe you're putting pants on, then you roll them over to one side, roll them again to the other side. We can do back massages, give them a lot of tactile input. That's something that's really stimulating. It's very calming. It could be as well. It depends on the child or how you're doing it. Um, but it's just something that, again, you're, you're incorporating they're lying on their side, and what am I going to do? I'm going to go ahead and stretch out their arm now. You know, and that's one way to get that passive range of motion right there and get that morning stretch. And while at the same time, then they're going to go ahead and reach across their body and you know, try to put their socks on. And so now they're, they're going from right to left side. They're crossing midline. Um, a great body orientation. So it's just looking at all those daily activities that you know, most parents do with their child. And I guess sometimes we don't even see how, how important that really is. And that's why we really try to promote having that child do this with their, with their parents. It doesn't matter whether you're helping them hand over hand assistance or just a little bit. It's that the going through the movements that is really very helpful. Um, play recreational activities would be um, just like think about climbing activities, stairs, playground equipment, rock wall climbing, you know. Again, even if it's one step, it depends on the child, but again, that increases strength stability. It's something that's really motivating for children. It's what other kids do. Why not do it as well? Um, pushing, pulling activities, wagons, boxes, kid furniture, grocery bags. Um, tactile play is really great. Anything that has different, um, brings different sensation to your skin. Um, you know, it's a lot of times shaving cream, some kids love it, some kids hate it. Um, but for the kids that do enjoy it, I mean, it's something that's kind of thrilling, you know, it feels different. It's not your usual sensation that you get from just daily stuff. Uh, vestibular activities are the, the, any type of swinging movement, any type of your body going through space. Um, so again, jumping, bouncing on trampoline, and you can think if you have a, one of those large trampolines, you know, you could have the child even just lie down and, and do it. I mean, they don't have to sit up, but there's lots of different ways to really promote a lot of stimulation, um, increase that function, increase the stretching, increase the strengthening, and I think, honestly, just increasing kind of the quality of life or really enjoyment in what they're doing. Uh, play recreational activities, um, some anti-gravity activities, such as kicking a ball, kick, kicking in the swimming pool. Uh, the swimming pool's a great activity, too, a lot of community um, have swimming pools. And um, use of the weighted objects, uh, tossing balls, bean bags, uh, making an obstacle course, and then um, adaptive community activities, just being really aware of what your community has to offer um, so that there are adaptive sports. And if they're not adaptive, a lot of times there are ways to adapt the activity that they can still participate with other kids. And that is all. Thank you.